the 11,000 people having to move, you end up with 400 people having to move. And this is part of what I'm saying about large hydro. Hydro, also large hydro, is part of the mix, but you have to have this type of attitude to it and this willingness to really work on good and sustainable solutions. This is just a micro example of the very same thing, typical for Norway, trying to keep the scenery also of the landscape intact. <clears throat> Finally, just about the work that I just want to mention very briefly because this is quite a challenge. The big, big infrastructure projects have a very, very bad track record in terms of people and how and the, the safety of people working on that site. We also have people like Little Girl there, this is which is from the northern part of India, the Himal Pradesh area, where a lot of migrant workers come to the big construction sites in order to get employment. So where, where is the responsibility of the company? Where is the responsibility of the state? This is, this is a challenging issue in addition to the responsibility for our people. We've had some uh, terrible accidents also here in Turkey. You remember the Soma tragedy uh, last year, um, where 300 people uh, were killed in a coal mine. And this is just illustrating how critical it is. If this is to be sustainable, it has to be sustainable also in terms of people working to develop the energy solutions for the future. Uh, one example of how to do this, this is from one of our plants here in Turkey. This is the first health and safety academy to be put on a big site in Turkey to our knowledge. Every, everyone working for us had to go through extensive training at this academy before they are deployed into the field to develop the project. So there's things you can do. There are things that we as an industry can do. And finally, uh, we, our ownership as Southcats is uh, from the Norwegian state. And we have some very clear directions that are given from the state. The, the Norwegians, we tend to believe in international standards. We're a small country in the corner of the world. So we believe in international institutions. We also believe in international standards. So we don't have very specific Norwegian standards for this. We apply the highest international standards. And that's a very clear order given to us as a country. And also, that's the expectation from the state. You should apply world class and international standards. And we are expected, expecting, they are expecting us to be open, to be transparent, and to report on everything that we do when we're out there in the field developing wind power, and hydro power, that they expect accountability. As a company, we have to report on that. Finally, just uh, a few final mentions about hydropower. As I said, we believe that hydropower will be even more important in the future, largely because also of climate change effects. We see increasing droughts, we see also increasing floods. Uh, hydropower done in the right way can be, uh, can be an important mitigating factor for that. But what we do think is needed is a multi-purpose approach. It's typical for here in Turkey also. The hydropower dams also provide irrigation to the farmers. So if we could start designing the hydropower plants so that they were there both for irrigation, for potable water, for flood control, uh, and for hydropower, that would be the way to the future, to select the good projects and develop them, so there's a lot of potential still, and then not develop the bad ones. There's good big hydro, and there's bad big hydro. And that distinction is sometimes lost in some of the uh, work also done by the industry. Like so that was uh, that was it. Thank you very much.
I'm going to tell you something about the World Bank. I have a question uh, to Professor Brussels. Uh, I think so you have a, you made a very good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we know that you know the uh, uniform global carbon tax is the cheapest one, so no doubt on that. But uh, there is an equity perspective also. So it's very difficult to justify to have the same level of carbon tax in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. It is it's a difficult to justify. And the second point is that if you see the current emission profile, so 90% of the global emission comes from only 30 countries. If that is the case, then you can extend one of your sensitivity analysis where you are doing this fragmented type of carbon tax system and see what happens if the carbon tax is focused on those bigger emitters, you know, having 90% of the global emissions. Thank you. Okay, I think, I think there are good questions. Um, and the way that, this, that these uh, integrated assessment models are implementing this uh, is, as I said, uh, through these uh, global carbon taxes. But uh, there is, uh, of course, a possibility to um, have financial flows you know, between the different regions. You know? So, for example, you can think of having different admission levels in different, um, in different uh, countries but then you have something like a, a uniform uh, emission trading system you know, that is actually equalizing the, the carbon cost, but then is redistributing uh, income between the different regions. And I think many of the uh, models have implemented it in this way. And that means even if you have an efficient level of equalized uh, carbon prices, uh, that's implemented in a way that takes into account the different situation in different countries and the science uh, different reduction targets you know, to the different regions. So these two things have not necessarily go together. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, I, I think you're right that very often in, in economic terms, we, we totally disregard uh, equity considerations you know, and just treat these two things as separate things. Uh, so we just look at efficiency and, and we think that we can uh, achieve all types of uh, redistribution afterwards. And very often that's not the case, so probably one has to be more serious about that here. Okay. Regina Betz um, from the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Um, a question also to Andreas Merschel. Um, you were talking about bioenergy, that it will have a kind of a crucial role or be quite sensitive to your results. So my question is what exactly is under this bioenergy. Are you talking more for biofuels or is it more in the electricity part? Can you explain a bit more in you know, which context it's in your world? Well, um, you will not find um, a graph that is detailed you know, where the uh, CCS is coming from. Uh, there is actually some more uh, detailed work in, in other chapters that look at um, CCS used in electricity, but as for the industry, um, here I think uh, uh, in most cases it's it's really in electricity, um, but but there is not really a, a split down of these different options. But what we what we see is that um, and th there was just a discussion that is trying to put the numbers in line that uh, what 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 would it imply actually to come to these uh, levels of bioenergy. Um, uh, we see that this is, of course, going together with a massive uh, change in, in land use patterns you know, and, and uh, afforestation and reforestation and other options that are, are used that are in direct conflict with other uh, development uh, pathways you know, that we are thinking about, the sustainability goals that we are thinking about. So I think there are a lot of potential trade-offs that, that, that are not made perfectly um, visible you know, in, in, in the analysis, and I think that is probably after something where we have to move on in the next assessment report because uh, there are a lot of these uh, potential conflicts. You know, uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, water and, and water scarcity and all these type of things that, that have to be addressed and look more carefully what it actually means if these models are implementing these technologies. Ulrike Lehr from GWS in Germany. 
First of all, I would like to really thank Ola for his comments on yesterday's early morning session. And um, don't believe anything. Everything you hear, and this was not the sole opinion of, um, let's say, 100% of this conference. So I appreciate that you mentioned it. Anyway, the questions. Um, uh, I would like to, the questions are addressing the scenario people. Um, uh, and it's a very simple question. How do the scenarios that we've seen, the IBCC scenarios, which have this, there's a lot of scenarios that have this sharp drop. I would like to have a short comment on the sharp drop. So what's happening there? There's a new technology invented or the world becomes reasonable, or sees reason or something. And then I would like to, um, from both of you, get a comment on how do your scenarios match? Are they related at all? Um, Achieving the oil that is using up this carbon budget you know, in an efficient way. That's usually not how it's done. Uh, usually, that is more or less implemented uh, step by step you know, uh, by the model. So he's he's designing you know uh, how this decarbonization uh, should look like over time. Uh, and so I don't know how the different people in the system models have done that, but I guess that is coming kind of falling out of of their uh, climate uh, assess or climate model you know, that they have implemented. So I, I would doubt that these are economically efficient pathways. We, I cannot judge because I don't see the carbon prices that are associated. Uh, and, and probably it's good that you don't see them. I've seen them in, in other assessments, like for the EU, and that you very I mean, easily can see that these are not efficient pathways you know, because the carbon prices go up and down, and, and so this can be. For our study, we use a lot of different, actually it's different uh, model type, this uh, uh, energy system optimization model. So for the model, we have to firstly just with the future for the energy service demand, that is, for example, for industrial sector, with the steel production linked in China, and also for transportation, how many turnover for freight and passenger, and for building, how many raw space will need to support, uh, to, to, to support the people need in the future. And then the model will to seek different technologies to meet the demand giant. The model is demand giant model. So the, the technology mix and fuel mix can tell you. So with the carbon picture for the relevant scenarios. And then you introduce the different carbon mitigation targets there in the model. And the model try to seek another round of emission round to give a combination of the technology choice and also the choice of the energy service demand. That means you can reduce, for example, part of your demand for space, uh, for, for space heating, demand for your transport, for example, and also you can also uh, train the uh, reduction by technology development, technology improvement, by efficiency, and also by return to renewable energies, nuclear, non-special energy futures. Thank you. I have a question for Peter. I'm interested in your topic, and I agree with you that the uh, renewable development is very important for uh, sustainable, sustainable economic development and energy using. Uh, but maybe the most important challenge for developing e renewable energy is that the very big conflict between renewable energy and the traditional fuel-based energy. Uh, in your opinion, how to resolve this benefit conflict? Thank you. Okay, I am Sylvie Zhao from China University of Petrovic.
the benefit, there is benefit conflict between that means if we develop renewable energy and the traditional fuel based uh, gen energy generators uh, will be lose their benefit. How to resolve this conflict? To, to that, thank you for your for your comment. I think maybe a good um, uh, example in question is actually our home country, Norway, which is a big oil and gas uh, producer, as you know, and also one of Europe's largest uh, renewable producers. So we face this type of dilemma. I uh, I will leave it for the politicians to actually make uh, the the decision making in terms of this. But you can easily see that there are some conflicts. I think where where we are in Norway, at least on this, is to say that yes, there is a role to play for both uh, renewable and for the fossil base, but we will have to use only the most efficient methods for developing uh, the fossil uh, fuels, and we believe gas will be a very important transitional fuel until we reach a totally renewable economy. So that's the way out of it for uh, Norway, which is heavily dependent on oil and gas and is trying to develop its, its renewable resources. But that there is a potential conflict, uh, yes, but I think uh, at least from the way the policy the discussion is going in our own country, it is trying to gradually dismantle the, the fossil part by uh, always using only the, the most efficient part of it, while gradually then uh, replacing it with uh, renewable energy sources. I'm not sure if that responds to your question, but uh, it's an attempt. Thank you. I think it's a positive one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in McGill from the University of New South Wales. And my question is regarding the, rather than the results of integrated assessment modeling uh, exercises, it's a bit more about the usefulness or otherwise of the entire approach. And uh, well, if Peter, you raised obviously the silliness of the discussion about renewable energy in the plenary, but I think there's also considerable silliness on the use of these models to try to make estimates of climate change damage. But uh, obviously we're looking at a different aspect of integrated assessment modeling with the work being presented more on the abatement side. But a uh, question on Andreas and then a question on a bit of, effectively the same question, I think. Andreas, what do you see as the key lessons of this exercise? I think in terms of integrated assessment modeling, the work done by the IPCC is about the best we've seen. But what do you see as the key lessons around the limitations of this sort of approach? and particularly in the way we can actually try and use it to impact policy making in a useful way. And it's really the same question to you, old Peter. It's really as someone in the, the game here. How do you see these modelling exercises and the way they might impact or not impact on the actual policy framework within which you guys operate and are trying to get this stuff done? Okay, so I think the, the main um, additional insight now that, that uh, IPC tried to, de to deliver, at least from my reading, in the fifth assessment report was exactly to look at uh, real world imperfections, you know, uh, moving away from very stylized uh, type of analysis into a more realistic realm. But I tried to as well highlight that, um, well, this was a good step, but we still have a lot of things in the models you know, that are not very realistic. You know? And uh, if you think about the idea of IPCC, I mean, uh, the, the idea is to lay out these different pathways and to describe uh, what are the technologies, you know, what are the consequences you know, of these different pathways and communicate that to the general public. And then I think then then it stops. You know? That's, that's what, what, what they can do and, and, and that's all they can do. Um, they cannot really um, well, dictate uh, to policy makers one specific pathway or a specific technology solution or a specific uh, policy fix, you know? but they can show what, what would happen in these simplified uh, uh, tools if you know, we change uh, the way forward. And, and I think that is helpful to understand. Uh, probably it's underappreciated uh, by policymakers because uh, selectively things are taken out of context um, in order to fit some political agenda. I think that's probably not 
the problem of IPCC, but the problem of how policymakers are using that. You know, um, I think it should be moving even more to realism, um, showing all the problems, you know, uh, and, and showing that a lot of these things are wishful thinking, potentially, if policy is not moving. And then, uh, as I said, it, it would be uh, a good information uh, of my move who was uh, co-chairing the Working Group 3, always talks about cartographer. Um, okay? So they are making a map of potential uh, pathways. And, and, and that is what, what, what this actually can be used for, to understand the different interactions. But, but we have to be humble you know, with the tools. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. My way we see it, I think I could maybe put it into three different parts. One is that uh, the, we as the industry see that we need to do our part. And we think we are in good shape to do so. And that says something about leaving some of this to the market also. Uh, to make sure that we have, uh, a, that we set up a system where people such as, companies such as Delta can use our competence both in the marketplace uh, and uh, as asset owners and as the developers and as producers. Uh, we, we believe that uh, we are concerned if we were to see very, very complex uh, regulation. And that leads me to the, to the next point, is that on regulation, it is sort of an issue of keeping it uh, simple, to keep it predictable. For all investors, predictability is, of course, very, very key in order to manage our risks. And, and for us, uh, as a company, we would be looking for those very simple, long-term, predictable solutions, not very complex, short-term, short-lived solutions. That would be very, very critical. And if you see where we've been investing now, in the UK, in Sweden, Norway, in Germany, they've done that. They've done Precisely that. And then thirdly, uh, we are also as players in the market seeing that there is a lot of development in the actual prices of these technologies. And that was also put forward in the wrong way, I think, during the first panel. There is significant movement also on wind technology, the prices are coming down. So you, you know we've seen those these, the, the, the cost curve for, for solar, but this is also to at least some extent true for wind. So it's becoming more and more and more competitive. So we still think that this is a transition. We need that, uh, that regulatory help uh, for a certain period of time, but it's, uh, I guess we are technology optimists in terms of seeing the prices uh, coming down and making it sustainable and profitable on its own terms. Yeah, the question is last question. Um, so the IPCC models uh, appear to be deterministic in nature, where you have um, we have multiple uh, scenarios where you say, okay, you give me a temper, you give me a, a carbon emissions, and that gives me a temperature. And then we change that uh, for multiple models, that, that, but each model in itself is deterministic as you give me uh, emissions and I get a temperature out of it. Have y'all done any work to make those stochastic, to get a range with each individual model, to sort of give you a confidence interval into the future? No. So there's no like way to interpret and say, okay, this is a range of reasonable estimates for a particular model. No, it's just yeah, so so I think you're totally right. So if you think about these twelve hundred scenarios I've shown you, you should not draw wrong conclusions from that. Uh, because that is not what you just mentioned, which would be nice, no, uh, to see how uncertainty plays a role in these different models, but it's rather uh, just how many models have run a specific scenario. Okay, so it doesn't mean that one thing is more likely than another or anything. It just says, you know, uh, out of what, what models have come up with what they think are sensible scenarios that show in the, in the database. Not more. Thank you. Turkey. I have two questions for uh, Peter. Uh, you made an interesting distinction between blue hydro and red hydro, which I agree with. So, according to your uh, view, what's the ratio of blue hydro and red hydro in the uh, hydropower project pipeline in Turkey? That's the first question. And the second one is uh, again, you mentioned that if you are born in a sort of 
village where there's a hydropower plant in uh, Norway, you are considered as lucky. In Turkey, that might not be the case. So I wonder what the exact measures that you take for uh, spreading the benefits of the hydropower development in your uh, project areas in Turkey. All right, thank you. Uh, that, that's a very good question. I think in terms of giving you a ratio for good and bad in Turkey, uh, I haven't really made that, that calculation, but maybe based on what I said also, and you can see some examples, my basic premise is that hydro does have a big challenge. Many places, and Turkey is among them. Uh, hydropower has unfortunately become a, dis a very devising, a divisive factor in many places, and it is linked to conflict. And my, my simple view is that uh, part of the reason behind that is the lack of a, a holistic approach to this, a more sustainable approach that takes the social and environmental impacts properly into account. Uh, so giving you a ratio, no, but maybe saying that uh, we believe that this is an area where we can contribute and where uh, private investment is also healthy because it's bringing with it uh, international standards that are really necessary and useful in this context. Uh, in terms of how to do this uh, locally, I think that's that's definitely the main challenge is in those countries where you don't have local benefits in terms of taxation being returned to the local area. And Turkey is one of those countries. We have other examples globally also where that is very much an issue. Mm -hmm. So for us, when we make the investment decision, before we even making that, we have to calculate what will it what will it take for us to then compensate people properly, to look at livelihood uh, restoration, to look at how to redevelop, let's say, bridges across reservoirs and whatever. All, all of which are largely lacking in many Turkish projects at the moment. And then that has to be part of the calculation you make, and you have to plan for the social and environmental aspects equally to what you do for the technical aspects. You bring in experts, you bring in teams, and you work very seriously in a planned way with those uh, items. Uh, and, and fundamentally, you work a lot with the local community. But of course, in, in, in Turkey, as many other places, what we find is that people are heavily influenced by past experience. And they've never seen the companies necessarily having taken this approach. So being a bit of a pioneer in that definitely has its challenges also because of the fundamental lack of trust. And I think that's where the hydropower industry really needs to prove itself. It needs to develop that trust uh, with local communities so that the fiber investments will be welcome in the future. Other comments? Yeah. Uh, So my professor, uh, my question is just to Professor Chen. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, about uh, 400 technologies are represented in your model. And I just wonder to which extent energy efficiency technologies are modeled. And also, if I understand well, uh, energy efficiency technologies will affect mostly uh, demand side, so energy demand. And then you you have a loop feedback on supply side. So um, I'd like to uh, understand more about how you manage this exercise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the technologies is, uh, the technologies uh, we consist the, the, for, for the supply side, we have for power generation, coal prevention, coal gas prevention, oil refinery, etc. This is the supply side technologies. And the 40 countries technology also consists of the demand side. I have already mentioned that we consist of more than 40, uh, what actually is about uh, 52 subsectors in the model. For different subsectors, we project future energy storage demand for these sectors, and we need different technologies covering existing technologies and also advanced technologies covering energy efficiency improvement technologies into the model to achieve this user defined energy service demand. So actually different kinds of technology, including energy efficiency improvement technology can be defined in the model. So I don't know whether I have answered your question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, today we have a very good uh, plenary session and uh, all our speakers give us uh, many uh, information on the low carbon development pathway. All these contents are related to energy development and energy using. So uh, the climate issue is really uh, important uh, issue uh, in our field, energy economics. Uh, so uh, uh, now uh, I will take this opportunity to thank uh, our uh, speakers uh, for giving us uh, wonderful presentations and also thank all the audience.
audience for your participation in the interaction with the uh, uh, speakers. And uh, finally, uh, please um, uh, forgive me to uh, 